and we are live. So ladies, thank you for tuning in and thank you for joining me at the table today. Today, I have an incredible woman sitting before us. I have Amina, the CEO of Triple F Photo Tours, and her story is just awe-inspiring. Amina, thank you so much for joining me today to share the story and the movement that you're starting. Thank you so much, Sherry, for this opportunity. I'm uh, looking forward to just talking. Now, we're going to go back a little bit because I want you to know a little bit more about Amina, who she is, where she comes from, and, and why she's doing what she's doing. And I'm going to leave you hanging just a little bit because we're going to get to the juicy part of how she is disrupting the status quo and really making a change and elevating women. So Canada is not your home country. No, it's not. No. Nope. And you came here with quite the whirlwind. I can only imagine what your mother and father would have been going through. The Butcher of Uganda. I think if we just let that simmer for just a moment, there is many in the room who perhaps have no idea who that is and what that references. Could you give me a little bit of a backstory on who that person is and what that actually means? So the Butcher of Uganda refers to Idi Amin. He was then president, um, very uh, uneducated as a president and um, hated the uh, Indians who um, were, you know, Uganda was home. We were born there, we lived there, we contributed to society and the economy. Um, but there was always that divide between the have nots and the have and the Indians were the have and the uh, Africans unfortunately were the have nots. And it started under British rule and um, only got worse as he bankrupted the country. Um, and overnight uh, in 1972, he gave us three months to leave our home and start anew. And uh, we ended up in Canada. Three months. I, I can't even imagine sitting at home and having somebody come and say you have three months, not yeah. to just vacate your home, but to pick up your family and leave your country. Well, and, the, and when it happened, my dad recalls that everybody thought he was joking because he always made these like really astronomical stating statements like, oh, the queen and I are, you know, like he'd always, the queen is my best friend. Oh, I'm, you know, she's my subject. But like, he was just crazy. Um, and so when it came and he announced it, everybody thought, oh my God, it's just another, you know, crazy thing that he has to say. And then it became more and more realistic as um, he was starting, but the, the, the army was starting to become more defensive, more attacking. And um, he never hurt or killed one Indian, I have to say, because of where we stood in society. But he killed and made over 400,000 of his own people. And mm -hmm. they never called it a, um, what do you call it? They never, you know, made the statement that it was execution. They never did anything about it, but yet it happened in Rwanda years later and it was a genocide. It was genocide mm -hmm. in Uganda as well, but it never, never came to be that they would dictate that. Um, but yeah, we had three months to leave and I was three, my sister was about 15 months, I believe. And um, um, when you, uh, as a Ugandan, your papers were stripped, your passports were taken, you had no papers, no, no status. Uh, so when we left um, Uganda to come to Canada, we, we had nothing. Wow. Wow. So you, you arrive in Canada and you wound up in St. Catharines? No, so we, we ended up, everybody came to Montreal at the Red Cross um, facility for processing. Mm -hmm. And so I don't remember how long we were there for, but uh, you had to go and wait your turn to be processed so that you would know where in Canada that you were going to be settled. And so it's a kind of a funny story when we 
you know, had my dad had the interview with the border guard, the border guard says to my dad, so where do you want to go? And my dad had been reading National Geographic on the plane and he's flipping through and he's like, oh, we'll go to the Northwest Territories because it looks so beautiful. And the guy said, well, there's nobody up there and it's freezing cold. So no, where do you want to go next? And my dad's flipping, flipping. And he's like, oh, how about New Brunswick? And the guy goes, well, there's no jobs. And again, it's cold. And so thank God he was so patient. And so finally he says to my dad, do you have any family in Canada? And my dad's going, well, I think I have a sister. Well, I know I have a sister. I have a sister in a place called Catherine's or St. Catherine's or something. <laughs> Stamped the thing and away we went. So we were there for eight years and then moved to Burlington where my parents still live. It's funny to have that concept of somebody going through a book <laughs> based on pictures, picking yeah. where they're going to be from. And it's, I'm originally from Nova Scotia. Oh, okay. So New Brunswick, I, it would be, I, it's a different type of cold in the winter than what we have here. Right. Yeah. In, in Ontario. But it is just funny. It's like you're looking through a menu. It's like, oh, that dessert looks really good. I think I'll go there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> With no concept. So what a process, even just coming into the country. Yeah, being because public. you're and young. As, like my parents were only 25 and 23. So imagine they, ex they expected their whole lives to be in Uganda. And yeah. life in Uganda back then was incredible from the stories and the pictures that I saw. Life was easy, you know. Um, work was not long days. Uh, weekends were spent with family or doing safari or in just enjoying your life. It was laid back and easy life. And then you come to Canada with nothing and you ha have two small children and you have to start from scratch, like nothing. And um, when we, I'll tell you another funny story. When we were living in St. Catharines, um, my sister, she was maybe by this time, I think like two years old. And we used to have to walk to the grocery store, all of us, because we didn't have a car. We couldn't afford to take bus or taxi. So we would trudge like you know two miles down the road to the grocery store I'd be carrying two bags my parents each my sister was too young and always I'm tired carry me carry me so she got so frustrated and cold and tired we were like where's Farah and she's hailing a taxi on the side of the road like this at two years old I don't know where she picked it up and so the guy would not let us off the hook and we had to take the taxi for two blocks home with no money like yeah, it was like, you know, scrounging for everything back then. Yeah. And eventually my dad, um, you know, even with my dad in a week of landing in St. Catharines, had two jobs. By day, he was an accountant. And at night, he worked at the horse racing track, um, taking mm. bets at the window. And my mom was home with us. And then eventually started selling um, door to door. I don't know if you remember, but Kirby vacuums back then. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. You will never guess. <laughs> Were you doing the same thing? It paid my rent when I was in university. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a, uh, but you appreciate where you came from and what you started with, right? Because mm -hmm. it makes you just want a better life for your, for your family and your kids. And they struggled like struggled hard and as did many of us. Um, but today the Ismailis, I'm an Ismaili Muslim, are very successful in this country. We're noted for our um, contribution to society. We're noted for our business acumen. Mm -hmm. Work ethic, hard work ethic. Hard work ethic, and yeah. Family values, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so really what they brought to our country really is a gift to the community that yeah, they have like, we'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's nice to see that that diversity and that culture can come and, and make us better and more aware mm -hmm. of what that looks like. And because oftentimes when you're born and bred here, it's, you take it for granted. Yeah. So but even after nice you live here for so many, so many years, you start to take things for granted, yeah. right? Yeah, you forget what yeah. the past was like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes we need to forget. Um, mm -hmm. so that we can overcome and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Like they Absolutely. Did really start to establish themselves a really good life. And that really good life has allowed you to have an education. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about that background. So I wouldn't say I was the most studious because I am an artist at heart. And, 
you know, back then, nowadays, when you go to school, they know if you're a visual learner or uh, like, you know, yeah. or like the, they understand the different types of learners that you can be. Back then, you either did or you didn't, right? And I couldn't couldn't get into the way of learning because I'm very visual and tactile and it was not it was not for me I, so I would sort of like give up on school and I'd be the class clown I'd be doing the things that I shouldn't be doing so I went to college tried university got sick and had to quit but at the end of the day it I was always driven there was something there that I had to do that I had to become my sister on the other hand very studious and very bright and has gone a long way with her education um and so we're very different in that respect but uh, also I think you are my soul sister and my <laughs> brother would be the equivalent to your sister like he just needed to look at the title on a book and yeah. he would walk in and ace the exam I right. can step to the cows come home and got a really good C yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I feel you on that one <laughs> yeah yeah um so but what I did get out of it is the knowledge that, um, and it came late for me, is that if I want something, then I just have to go out and get it. I have to work hard for it. It's not going to be given to me. And if I want that kind of life, I had an amazing career in film and television, for instance. I just, it came by chance, but it was the most amazing career. And it didn't wear, it didn't matter where my education lied. Mm. It was about the creativity part of it. It was about knowing um, how to work the system, in essence. Yep. And I thrived in that in that environment. Um, and then, you know, my life changed. I adopted a child, got married, and started working in a completely different um, in industry in mortgages. But what oh. I got was the artistic background from my mom, who's very artistic, and the um, the uh, numbers and analysis from my dad because he's an accountant. Yeah. So I have the best of both worlds, which I'm very mm -hmm. lucky. Mm -hmm. So while you were in film and broadcasting, is that what sort of spurred the photographer in you? Is that what yeah. Yeah. Well, my dad gave me a camera at the age of 10. So like many, you know, you get your camera and yeah. I would be with that Kodak everywhere I went, snap, 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 right? But when it came to going to college or further studies, I don't know why back then I never picked photography. I picked fashion design mm -hmm. and I could never, like I never got the grades that my other fellow students were getting, excuse me, in fashion design. And I was always walking around the photography area. So I don't know why I never switched back then. Um, but then when I went back, when I got into film and television, I picked up the camera and got really serious with it. And I was without, I was a camera all the time, taking pictures on set, on, you know, different locations that we went. And it was just, it was my passion. And mm -hmm. you could find me taking pictures of everything. But again, I never followed that because I didn't think I could make it a career, which was funny mm -hmm. enough. And so when I, um, was working in mortgages and dying a slow death because there's no creativity there. <laughs> that camera kept calling, like, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. And, but I needed it to make a difference. I needed it to mean something if I was going to leave a well paying career. So, yeah. hence why I came up with Cameras for Girls. Exciting, absolutely exciting. So, for those who are watching and listening in, uh, Amina does all kinds of photography. She can yeah. be found doing headshots and branding and family. So you have been able to make a career mm -hmm. out of photography, but most importantly, you've been able to ignite your passion so yes. that it's not just a career, but your passion really is paving the way forward for other girls. Yeah, absolutely. It's really helping them out and I love that your story has a twist. So not only are you helping out other female photographers, helping them launch, you're also bringing other people to your home country. Mm -hmm. So camera for girls, let's start there. Okay. So you, cameras for girls. Yeah, here's that uh, background. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cameras for Girls is currently nonprofit and we're seeking charity status, just so I could put that out there. So um, when I was in mortgages, I came up um, and I had been to Uganda in 2007. It was the first time going home. And I was there to do a documentary about the return of us Indians who had, some of us were starting to come home, reclaim our properties, resettle, build the economy. Um, and I wanted to tell that story. So I went camera in hand uh, and no money. And I was like, I'm gonna tell this story. So I went and it was the most transformative experience of my life because those stories and the pictures that I grew up seeing about Uganda and hearing the stories from my parents, it was nothing like that when I got there in 2007. Mm. The world that we left behind had been raped and pillaged. The government had left nothing. The people were poorer than poor. The poverty was astounding. And um, the plight of girls and women especially was very sad to see because I grew up in Canada where all opportunities are afforded to us. And right. I felt like, horrible because I had squandered many of those opportunities. Um, and it was uh, eye-opening eye for me to see what I had and what they didn't have. Um, and I knew at that time I needed to make a difference of some sort. I'd grown up uh, with the message from my parents to, to give back, you make the world a better place. So I'd always been doing charity work all my life volunteering, um, you know, helping people who are less than have less than me any way I can. But that because that message stuck for me. What a beautiful message. It is. It's an amazing thing to know that we came with nothing, but my parents always instilled in us that it doesn't matter what you don't have. Somebody else has less than you even. So give and of I, yourself. I think that's important for the listeners to take in that if you've been sitting wondering what you can do, that maybe you don't have an endless bank account that can fuel the fire for somebody else, that you you do have time and you yeah. do have talent. Absolutely. And that there is an organization in your community right now who would benefit from your goodness. So if what you're hearing is resonating at all, I would encourage you strongly to look into your community and see where those pockets are and start giving back. You can start with Rotary, like I'm a Rotary member. So Rotary is a great uh, organization that works within the community to help others. With Perfect. Many so different Rotary ways. sees an increase in membership. Yeah. This is really great. So the Rotary is it, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. So, yeah. yeah, so look, whatever community that you are in right now, look them up and yeah. see if they're seeking new members. I'm sure they are. Oh, they and always are. If yeah. your talent, I'm sure that they could. And it's a small way that you yourself can start. Yeah, and that. it gives you so much in return, right? Oh, it does. So when I came back, I knew I needed to make that uh, difference, but I was working in mortgages. I was dealing with uh, having adopted our child who had special needs. Life was crazy. Um, but then I was at this point in my life, do I keep going down this path that's not making me happy or do I go back to photography and film and make myself like feel something again? Because I was dead inside. It was a hard slog um, through adoption and special needs world that I was not ready for. Um, and so, but I said to myself, if I'm gonna get into photography, it has to mean something. It has to mean more than just taking photos. It has to mean that I'm changing lives. So. I came up with the idea in the middle of the night. So that's when I do my best thinking. <laughs> um, and I woke up my husband in the middle of the night, August 2017. And I said, hey, Thomas, I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And he literally woke up and he's like, oh, shit, here we go again. Because I'm always coming up with crazy ideas. And I think that's the, you know, that's part of the creative process. Yeah. Yep. And um, I said, I'm going to go back to Uganda and change lives by teaching girls photography. I had no idea how I was going to do this or if it wasn't even going to be possible. But he went back to bed and I stayed up the rest of the night making my business plan. And a year later, I was in Uganda doing my first training. And yeah, I had collected 
any kind of camera that I could, any point and shoot that I could carry. And I had raised some money and taken out all my savings, which wasn't a lot. And I went on a wing and a prayer and I taught 15 girls. And just to back it up a bit is when I thought about this, I thought I would just go to any school and teach girls, not realizing that in many respects, they don't have internet, they don't have electricity. And right. if I'm giving a free camera in many cases with no end result of changing their lives, truly, it would be sold for food. So I talked to my friend in the ground who's a journalist and who had been there since day one when I went in 2007 as my fixer. And he said to me, I mean, if you're really going to make this success, you need to teach girls who are under um, endeavoring to become journalists. And in my mind, coming from first world Canada, I said, why the hell would I teach girls who just come out of journalism? They would know cam they would know photography. They will have cameras. And he said, right. wrong. They go through the four-year course. There is maybe 600 students over the four years with 100 cameras to share on those four years. So they might get one or two opportunities to work with a camera at one to two hours, three hours max. So it's not enough knowledge. Furthermore, they'll graduate, but they can't get paid or get the job because they don't own the camera and they don't know how to take photos with it. Whereas here, you go for your job as a journalist and you're just like, you know, you just have to write the article and you'll have a photographer to come and take your story, uh, your, your the photo for you. There, you need to be able to do it all. So it clicked. And so we started working with these girls who are either in their last year of university program or out in the marketplace, um, have just graduated or are out looking for work and can't find it. And so today, to date, we've taught 32 girls and 11 and possibly 12 today might have full-time jobs. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm very proud of it because I literally have no funding at this point. Right. So a lot of generous supporters have come through GoFundMe or savings, and I get a lot of uh, camera donations. And what I can't use, I have a source here in Newmarket that will take what I can't use and help me trade it in for what I can use, which is awesome. Oh, awesome. Yeah, because when I on my first training, I just used any camera that I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. In the second, I may I like streamlined it so every girl gets the same camera. And nice. I want to make sure the readers understand or the listeners understand is I give them the camera to, te to keep. I teach them over three days how to, you know, get the basics down mm -hmm. and then tell stories that matter to them. And then what I do is I circle back after I've sent all my visitors home to Canada or Europe or the U.S. And I pick five of the 15 girls who showed the best, the most interest or the acumen for it. And together we go and work with a local Ugandan based NGO that has the same themes of alleviation of poverty, gender equality, education as a right. And we help support them with imagery that they need for their marketing. But the girls get field experience building a portfolio with supporting images so that when they go for a job, they have something to like to prove. And then when I come back to Canada, I continue to teach online for a whole year. Oh, wow. um, yeah, we do private Facebook group, private WhatsApp group, uh, Zoom calls, uh, video tutorials and monthly assignments, which helps them cement the different concepts that they're learning. Plus they get a 60 page manual so that they can keep reviewing what they need to learn from it. And then um, after all that's done, I help them with resumes, cover letters, and LinkedIn profiles. So it's sort of like a full package that when they go to get that job or apply for that job, they have all the tools in their belt to be successful. Literally. Yeah, yeah. Like, Literally. And I say okay. to the girls that I'm giving you these tools, yeah. but I am not going to handhold you because if you don't work hard for this, then you're not going to get it. If you want it, the tools are there, but I can't, I, I'm teaching you how to use the tools to get what you want. So to, to circle back to make sure I'm fully understanding and just so that our listeners are fully yeah. understanding is that this is a program that you gift these girls. There's no yeah. charge, for no these charge. Girls, that you 
in Uganda are making a difference with these girls that yeah. they're either in their last year of education or have just graduated. Mm -hmm. And based on the poverty that still exists in that country, they just don't have the tools of the trade that here in Canada or in North America, yeah. most of the people listening would be in, in North America, for us, it's a given. that if you apply for a program and it's photography, that you then have the means to come up with the tools of the trade. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's that concept of not having the tools, but still wanting to do that education would be a really foreign concept. Yeah. So yeah. For these girls to have the fortitude and the desire to go through a four-year program and not even having the tool of their trade to facilitate that learning, yeah. I mean, that in itself is inspiring because you don't hear of that really a lot um, in Canada. Well, like me, right? I thought, why would I teach journalists? Like, what are you talking yeah. about, right? So the same, I had the same kind of concept. Um, and just to tell you success stories, in my first training, there was a girl named Jonita and she had a job. Um, so I did the training in August. She had gotten a job in June. She wasn't getting published. She wasn't getting paid. And she was just mm -hmm. on the list because she didn't own a camera and she didn't know how to use one. Three days after the training was finished, she went to show her editor that now she had a camera and now she could use it. And she was put on full-time payroll and now she gets paid and published four times a week. And when the roof flew off her mom's home, she was able to repair it. And now she's able to live on her own, support herself and her family of five siblings and her mom and her community and make a difference. I said goosebumps. I said <laughs> goosebumps. So it's a, it's a year long mentorship that you're giving these girls mm -hmm. to give them, really to give them a leg up. You're mm -hmm. breaking a cycle of the have nots and you're allowing them to be the haves. That yeah. They're having not just the education, but the tools and the confidence, the resources, that you're helping them build their portfolios. They're also giving back into their community by working yeah. with nonprofit organizations. So your values that you hold dear to you here you are bringing back to your home country. Mm -hmm. like it really is just, it's a full circle. Like yeah, it's an amazing yeah. full I'm circle. trying. And it keeps evolving because we do have hopes to expand. We've been, we've been asked to expand to Mexico, to Costa Rica, and even in Afghanistan um, with other photographers who are trying to do similar things, but don't mm -hmm. have the resources. So our plan, once we get charity status and are able to raise funds, it will be that we will then have a back end where they can um, access the training that I've been doing, the videos that I've been producing, um, all of that. So it's sort of like, you know, um, all in a box kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then they can just uh, facilitate on their end because challenge will always exist in these developing countries of funding. Right. So if we can sort of help on that respect, we can expand to help more girls, more women like globally not just mm -hmm. in Uganda. And I think the interesting piece of the story that it is time to introduce is that there's two ways to help funding the program. One, there's GoFundMe. So if you look into the description, you are going to see that there is a link and there's gonna be two links actually. One is an email address where you can contact Amina. If you happen to have access to new or used photography equipment, she would love to connect with you. <laughs> she knows a good place where it will go to good use. And if you don't have access to those tools, or if a monetary donation is more in keeping so that they can do exactly what is needed, there is a GoFundMe link. And I really encourage you at $5, $10 and upwards, there is nothing too small and nothing too large that can't be contributed to help this really make a global impact, not just into Uganda, but as you get that charity status, mm -hmm. you're going to be impacting different countries as mm -hmm. well, which, I mean, how exciting is that? So that's the one way that we can automatically make a difference in your world. But this triple F photo tour yes. is another way. And I'm sure there's many listeners that are just like me that have Africa is on their bucket list. And you're helping to facilitate checking that off of the bucket list while also giving back into your program. Can you tell me what that looks like? 
Yeah, so Triple F Photo Tours, um, the Triple F means fun, photography, and philanthropy. And um, everybody's going to say, but that's PH. Well, just look at the tagline, you'll see why. And so basically, yeah. when I started Cameras for Girls, I needed an engine to bring money into it. Because without charitable status, without, um, you know, having the reach uh, out there to, for people to know about this, it's hard to bring money in. So what this does is take enthusiasts or amateur photographers or even people who are like you who want to go to Africa on a 18 door, day tour, two days back and forth for travel um, of Uganda. And you see guerrilla trekking, two safaris, community engagement, um, chip, like so many things, waterfalls, like the nature is incredible. It is after all known as the Pearl of Africa. And, um, but, you also get to see the impact your dollars when you spend it to travel with us is making with cameras for girls so 20 percent of what you spend to come with us goes directly to the programming to support the girl throughout her training with the camera all those things but you many people will go on a bucket list tour of somewhere once in a lifetime trip and they don't know what how is that impacting the community at large how are we traveling ethically and responsibly through these national parks without impacting the environment. All of this is very important in a country that sustains itself on tourism dollars. Mm -hmm. And so when we go, for instance, um, gorilla trekking, it's not easy. It can be difficult due to different fitness levels. But when we hire a local porter and you'll look at it and say, oh my God, that is nothing for $25 US for a porter for them that can that's half their monthly salary right there mm -hmm. because the average monthly salary for Ugandan is $50 US what's $50 US to us is a meal out so you see it it, when you get to see how you impacting the local community and not only these girls it makes that trip even more amazing for you because you're you're not just thoroughly enjoying what you're seeing with your eyes but you're enjoying what you're seeing with your heart it's mm -hmm. impacting like all senses right and so I had a lady from Canada come last year with me and um, she uh, she wanted not last year sorry we we're st still stuck in COVID so 2019 yeah. was supposed to be there in August of 2020 and of course COVID so when she came with me, June, 2019, she had dreams of going to Uganda or Africa since she was five. And she had the choice of going to Peru or to Africa. And Uganda was not even on her list. But when she read about what I'm doing there and how the monies that she's spending would impact the local community, she changed her plans and came to Uganda. And she kept on saying, oh my God, I can't believe how green it is. Cause it is green, like, you know, that green, like Ireland green, it's like mm -hmm. that. And um, she was just like, to this date, she shares her photos and she shares her stories and her eyes light up and her heartbeat quickens and she just can't wait to come back. And that's the experience we wanna to provide to our visitors. Um, we take care of everything like flights, meals, amazing hotels, all your excursions, two safaris. You never go on thing and get two safaris. No. One that is a walkable safari. You get out of the car and you walk among oh, the zebra yeah. and the giraffe and the monkeys. And it's like, it's, yeah, it's life-changing. It is, there's nothing, but I had the opportunity to go to Australia and one of the tours that we did was to the Blue Mountains. And we mm. were walking in the wild with the kangaroos. Yeah. So for anyone who is listening and your eyes light up and just get really wide, I can tell you it it's like seeing a herd of cattle. Yeah. It was it was kangaroos. So to be able to see that in Uganda, you roaming in the wild. Yeah. In their home. The it giraffe. ruins the zoo for you forever. Like I oh. can't go to the zoo anymore because I'm like no. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's just, if it's on your bucket list, eyes are really wide with wonder right now, then you really need to reach out to Amina and you need to find out about her, her next trip or at least find out about the tour. So mm -hmm. as you're planning that bucket list, you know what you are planning for. So mm -hmm. you can start to, to save up and it is an investment. Um, those bucket lists, those once in a lifetime trips, yeah. they, they are a bit of an investment. 
but it's an investment in your experience. It's an investment in a country that relies on tourism dollars. Yes. And this program is investing back in girls. Mm-hmm. But it's a win-win no matter what way you look at it. I love, I saw a quote that, that you were quoted actually. And it's when you treat your community like brother and sisters, you make this world a much better place. Yep. I totally and believe I that. I would say that you are a beautiful sister who is making the world a better place not just here in Canada but back in your home country you really are bringing this full circle and I can see the passion just lights up in you and that fire I can feel is just burning now there's I mean I think we could probably spend all day long talking about all of the good and the glory that you're doing but really what I want people to do is to reach out that this is just a tip of the iceberg. This is just a little bit about what Amina is bringing into this world. And it's a really new initiative. Like we're just waiting for charitable status right now. Yeah, yeah. We, um, I went in 2018, uh, August and June, 2019. Was supposed to go in August, but of course. And so as soon as it's like clear to fly, I'm on a plane. Like I, I'm already saying to people, I'm going in August, we're going in August. Well, we're not gonna get the vaccine. So hardly, probably not, but I can dream. Because, yes. you know, um, but yeah, there's been a lot of interest in the tour and uh, the, the Cameras for Girls program. So I've only got seven, uh, I only take seven people each time because not only am I working with the girls, but when I'm taking my travelers, I want them to have a small intimate group experience where mm-hmm. I get to work one-on-one with a person who might be wanting to get that image of the lion on safari and can't figure out their settings. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God. And you know, it's about calming down, breathing, knowing your settings and then getting the shot. So I, I guide you through all of that as well, because there are a lot of, you know, once in a lifetime moments you're going to miss if you don't know your camera settings. So before the people even come on the tour, I'm making sure everybody knows how to at least operate their camera settings because that's important. If you're coming on a photography tour, that's the whole point. So I do that uh-huh. even before we leave, you get, you know, tutorials to know how do I get my camera to do what I want to instead of doing it on auto? Because when you rely on the camera, you miss the shot. Right, right. What an impact you're making. Um, even that little piece, like going above and beyond for your travelers, not just giving them an intimate impact in Uganda, making sure that they're experiencing all of that. But even before you pack your bags, yeah you're having your tutorials and your lessons to make sure that you are getting the best of everything that you possibly can. Yeah, because I want them to come back and tell their friends and their family that, oh my God, I went on this amazing trip. You have to go, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're documenting your story that you yeah. can then come home and we can actually print it out. It's not sitting on a phone. You're not just exactly. going to upload it to social media or Facebook. You're actually going to print those photos out. Yeah. You're going to create those memories that you then can share with your friends, your family, and you can keep passing those down so that we're inspiring others to do the exact same thing. Oh, absolutely. Because I believe it's not just about the beauty that people should go to Uganda for, but to to meet the beautiful people. The people Mm -hmm. is what makes me keep coming back. They are gracious. They are just incredible. When I went in 2007, I was scared to go back because we had been kicked out and I thought that I was going to get um you know not no welcome when I told people that I come back and I was kicked out my family and I were left under Idi Amin I would get hugs and thank yous for coming back and I was like it was like mind-blowing and I keep going back because it's the people you know Mm -hmm. it's it's people that yeah and their stories are worth sharing. Oh, absolutely. Because the they're just, are worth sharing. Uh, yeah, yeah. So as we wrap things up, yep. I do want to again encourage people to reach out to Amina. If anything that she has said has inspired you, maybe you've woken up in the middle of the night and you left your husband sleeping. You, you didn't let him in to what those inner thoughts were. But if what Amina is speaking about, if that has inspired if that's triggered something inside of you, wake them up. 
let them know, share your secret and reach out to Amina to see yep. how she email me to, yep. to do this. I'm sure you're open to those. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The absolutely. more questions we can get burning, the more that we can help others in the world, the better off we all are. We all have a gift right inside of us that yeah. we're dying to share. We all have our passion. If you can learn to harness that passion and that gift and pass it on to others, mm -hmm. not only are you enriched, but so are they. So I'm, you know, I'm here for uh, anybody who wants to reach out and, you know, talk about it, get some advice, learn that, whatever. That's awesome. If you have a camera that's been sitting around and you just don't know what to do with it, one, sign up for the triple triple F photo tour so you can be shown what to do with it and have a plethora of opportunity to use that. And if you don't think that that's on your list, then again, reach out so that you can donate the camera and have the girls looking to get those jobs and create a better life for themselves and their families. You're literally giving them the tools that builds a career, something as simple as the camera can watch and build someone's career. And if donation is what you can do right now and you see fit and call, there is a GoFundMe link. And again, that is in the description. So I do want you to click on the link and please feel free. Anything, anything is appreciated and it all adds up. Every little penny, it all adds up yes, together. And together we will make an impact and it allows Amina to go back into her home country and bring some of what she's learned here in Canada, some of the gratitude that she has. And it allows her to see her home country in a different light. And she certainly is giving back. She is one of the sisters that when you treat your community like brother and sister, you make the world a much better place. And I know together that we can help her to create even more good and leave a legacy for all of the lives that you're touching. Thank you and so much, that, Sherry. I know that time is precious and that uh, you've given so freely of your time today. Your story is inspiring. It's fun to listen to and the impact that you are making on your travelers and on your photographers. It's uh, heartwarming. And you certainly have lit the fire in my belly to know that if you want it bad enough, it's right at the edge of our fingertips and yep. we can work for it and do anything that we set our minds to. So thank you for being a light in the world thank and for you. sharing your story. Thank you so thank much. You. So as we conclude, I do want to remind you to take a moment for your own gratitude. We are not filling a cup this year. We are filling a bucket. So I hope that you have gratitude in your life that your bucket is full. I also hope that this finds you with your heart being light. If something is weighing heavy on your heart, please take a moment to sit and pause and work through that so that you can lighten up your heart. And above all else, my beautiful sisters, I want you to take this moment right now to stop and let your soul sing your beautiful praises. If someone hasn't told you today, you are enough. You are worthy, you are loved, and our community is better because you are in it. Thanks for tuning in and have a blessed day.